Good evening. Now, I'm insisting on someone, on something, I'm sorry. I don't know whether we'll, we'll be able to do it. And please believe me, since I'm your guru. <laughs> so, take my word for it. I mean, there is a halo behind me. And, no, seriously, I'm not your guru. I don't even sign books. And as I said earlier on, you are the owners, you are the main characters, as it were, and these are your consultants. But this is my opinion, I'm suggesting this, but I, I'm not imposing anything, but I, I think it would be nice that uh, we are just a drop in the ocean here, that when we go out and when we discuss with our friends and uh, colleagues and students and wh whoever we meet actually and when we discuss with these people we tend to be uh, considered as a stupid ignorant you don't know anything about economics you are a uh, just uh, uh, inspired by plots and you can see plots everything but so I was thinking just Think of all the objective of all the objections that they could raise against it. Just think uh, what Monti says about Italy, what Parodi said when they say Zimbabwe is behind the corner with the lira, we will have 3,000 percent inflation rate, and uh, etc. Think of all the possible objections, and because we want to uh, be able to respond to these objectives. So let's squeeze from them, since they are so nice and fresh, mm. let's squeeze them and um, have, as it were, more weapons in our uh, armamentarium. And tomorrow afternoon we'll have a much longer session, much longer Q&A session, and we've changed our agenda as well, because in the morning, we will have more MMT because I think it's important to continue and uh, expand on this. And I, I may suggest to Stephanie to talk about an, an author, Wynne Godley. She doesn't know about him and tonight I'll tell you about him, who he is. Okay. <laughs> seriously for a second more MMT and then we'll have a longer Q&A there will be a sort of round table and they will tell us the uh, default uh, uh, Italian default that the, and the uh, abandoning euro what could happen in terms of the current accounts um, gas price my store Italy buying uh, oil and uh, our savings etc now we can have questions. So, uh, it's up to you. Well, thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. I have a question. Paolo, in a way, uh, stole the main stage and he said that we'll be talking about this tomorrow. But, if possible, my question would be the following. If Briefly, can we have some um, material to be able to respond, to reply to those who are asking us how this passage is going to take place, this leaving the euro, this debt which is in the hands of French, Germans, how would it be paid, the, the Italian debt, that's my question. So I know Paolo has just said that we are talking about this tomorrow, but could you start discussing this? Are we going to pay this debt, to pay, to pay it back, first of all? And if we um, go away from the Eurozone, so... And then I have another question. What do you think of a senior age? You, uh, I would like to know what the meaning of senior age is for you, what the space it has in this uh, framework. And I hope you are going to talk about it tomorrow because tomorrow, today we had a wonderful overview, but we probably uh, would like to know also something about this and about the future. So, just an anticipation of what in concrete could happen and something about seniorage. 
what happens if we are going to get out of the euro? Because you said that Europe will not accept it. So, what do you think? But that's uh, uh, for tomorrow, actually. I apologize. I know that you are interested in this, but there will be a session devoted to this, to what happens if we leave the eurozone. So I think uh, we should stick to other topics. And if possible, uh, brief questions. Good evening. I would like to propose questions for tomorrow's discussion, maybe or now. Your personal definition of community first, and then with the genesis and development of the various hierarchies uh, that dominate us. Do you know the experiment of utopia uh, realized by Adriano Olivetti until the 1960s here in Italy? Do you know anything about this experiment by Adriano Olivetti in Italy? No. <laughs> it's not a oh, is your thing on? We need to tell Paolo that his is not working. Oh. He needs work? to be on the phone. I know the machine, uh, Olivetti, so that's about the extent of my experience. But uh, uh, regard to the, the previous question, uh, I'll, I, I will just say very briefly, we'll answer it in more detail tomorrow. But the answer, the short answer is, uh, you say we're going to pay back the debt in lira or whatever you denominate the new currency in and not in euro and if they don't like that then they can spend the next several years litigating it in the courts as the uh, Argentinians uh, did with all the uh, the dollar uh, denominated debt holders I could add something. Uh, re regarding the scenarios, it all depends how you withdraw from the euro and who you do it with. You have allies in other countries. You also have enemies within Italy. If you withdraw the euro and let the banks operate it, you can be sure it's not going to work. So the question is, who will be withdrawing from the euro? Will it be Italian industry, employers, people, or will it be the banks making a game for themselves? If you withdraw, will you get Greece and other people to join in a different customs union? But most important are the reasons you give for whatever you're doing. If you give a reasoned explanation of why you're withdrawing from the euro, that you're not withdrawing from Europe as such, you're withdrawing from the hijacking of Europe, and you're not letting yourself be hijacked, and you're standing up for the original idea of what Europe was, then you'll be in the driver's seat. Well. Maybe uh, I could be uh, keen to a more radical uh, solution, as I try to explain. Europe never existed. Europe was never never, never built for the people, but for the absolute hijacking of any power from the people. I am not aware of Europe being created to help people and nations, thereby, I must confess that I don't understand why people could be reluctant 
to leave a dying system, a dying economy. The problems, as I tried to explain, was Italy was killed by adopting the euro. There is no peaceful solution because the European ruling elite will never accept any kind of change. The sole way is to decide to leave a dying system. What could happen? What could happen, happen in Argentina? Argentina defaulted. The very day after, banks from everywhere of the world begged the Argentinian government to ask for new loans. Default always existed in the world. So, Italy would save the whole European people and maybe the whole world by deciding to get rid of a system which is an absolute infamy. Aureliano Ferri, thanks for being here with us. I would like to ask you your opinion about Franklin Delano Roosevelt's experience, New Deal, productive credit, Bretton Woods Agreement, and the 15th of August 1971. Your opinion on this. Thank you. I guess that means me. Uh, when uh, Roosevelt devalued the dollar, he put American employment first and said that the function of a currency was to promote the domestic economy. Uh, in 1971, the reason that President Nixon took the dollar off gold was because for the previous 20 years, every single year, the entire U.S. balance of payments deficit stemmed from overseas military spending. The private sector of the United States from 1950, when the Korean War began, until 1971, was in balance exactly every year. America makes money on foreign aid because it tied its aid to American food exports and collected dollars in exchange. The entire deficit, the entire supply of dollars that ends up in foreign central banks year after year during the 1960s either was cashed in for gold which finally fell to the 25% gold cover, or it became in, lent to the United States Treasury by buying Treasury bills. One of the things that uh, the earlier charts have left out 
is the fact that 80% of the growth in America's domestic government debt in the 1960s was held by foreigners. That foreigners have been financing the domestic government deficit. Our discussions here have focused on the fact that the central bank can create credit rather than taxing. But what the dollar standard has done is tax the whole rest of the world. It's the central banks of Italy, Germany, France, and China, and Japan that have financed the American deficit that has been spent on military, uh, military operations surrounding Europe and Asia. This is the reason why two years ago in Yekaterinburg, Russia, Russia, Brazil, India, and China, with Iran as an observer and South Africa joining, set out to create an alternative to the dollar. Because today, the dollar is not simply a computerized IOU, as we've been talking about, it's also the embodiment of United States military spending in the rest of the world uh, and all of the U.S. policy that goes through it. Central bank holdings and central bank reserves are held in the form of claims on the United States Pentagon for its military operations and uh, the new policy of uh, non-military assassination of people who do not agree with a free market American style. evening and thank you for giving me the opportunity of asking two questions briefly. The first is uh, linked uh, to what I've already heard from you and it refers to a word that is at the basis of this capitalistic system and this is the relationship you have with growth. Growth, growth which is the foundation, I think it is, together with uh, other things but at the a foundation of this system that we are going to oppose. So uh, how do you justify this need for growth? And the second thing is the, uh, what the, your opinion as regards regulation of a financial market. From my point of view, there is a need to own the underlying for, uh, for all derivatives. And what do you think of these financial market regulations? Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to take regulation and I'll take growth? Okay. Um, right. On the question of regulation, the vast majority of fancy financial products which exist right now serve no public purpose and should be banned. The, uh, the whole scope of regulation is to uh, respond to a pre-existing problem. So we say to the banks, you have to have higher capital buffers in the event that there is a financial accident. That to me is the wrong way of doing it. You have to uh, try to prevent the source of the problem in the first place. And the way you do that is by banning the activity that creates the accident, as opposed to creating the safety net after the accident has already occurred. And I'll leave the question of growth to Stephanie. Thank you. The question of growth. For so many economists, growth is the objective, it is the end. An economy is considered successful if it's growing. And how do we measure growth? Output. We use GDP. 
And I think so much of the preoccupation with growth in the current context is driven by the concern over the debt level because it's the debt to GDP ratio that has people so concerned. And the debt to GDP ratio comes down if the GDP is growing rapidly. That is the way to make the debt sustainable. The economy must grow faster than the rate of interest. And then the debt is considered safe, sustainable. But is growth really the best way to measure economic well-being? Could we improve well-being by producing the same amount of output, but with a better, more equitable distribution? Better quality goods, not necessarily more goods. <laughs> Worker productivity increases GDP growth, and that's a good thing. More productive workers mean more available consumption goods for everyone. But if there's no income to allow people to enjoy and share in the economic growth, then what good is it? I don't know what I could ask uh, Monti or Prodi, as you mentioned, Paolo, but why didn't we speak about Freemasonry, for example? Should we, here in Italy at least, because based on the portrait that we can build, that there are just four or five mad bankers, but there is something beyond that, maybe the church, maybe the Freemasonry and other things. Well, <coughs> Should I repeat? Is it clear? Sorry, he is repeating for the audience because uh, that was not sufficiently loud. So the question is about Freemasonry, whether Freemasonry could be a role about in this. Thank you. Well, my comrade, uh, you raise a crucial question. Freemasons are now deeply divided. Uh, initially, Freemasons in France and Italy became powerful because they sustained in France the Republic against the Church, in Italy because they sustained Italian Risorgimiento unity against the Catholic Church. But now, a deep change happened. First, as far as I know, an increasing number of Freemasons are more and more trying to be close to the church and the Catholic Church, and they turn to the right. On the other side, both in France and Italy, the power of the Freemasons is now declining. What is now controlling institutions is right, extreme right-wing Catholic organizations. 
like the Opus Dei or worse, the Society of St. John. Both openly wishing to install a totalitarian Catholic state over the country. And uh, this is a true problem I studied with an historian friend of mine. Some of us uh, knows well Annie Lacroix. The church never accepted either the Third Republic or the Italian Republic. The church openly supported both the fascist regime and the Nazi regime. And now that I could swear, if you want to be hired in the European community, you must be a good Catholic in the basement of the European community in Brussels. There is an altar dedicated to the Virgin Mary and the European flag is the crown of the Virgin Mary when she appeared in Fatima. So, this is my answer. Since you are not obeying and not following my instructions, I mean, we can call it a day. No, look at how many people are standing. So please, brief questions and brief answers because, I mean, we have very long queues. Otherwise, we won't be able to, to go to bed. So that's my final call. Last call. Good evening. I would like to know, from a technical point of view, who or what are private uh, capital markets and materially, how does the uh, Euro manufacturing take place? I mean, when a state asks for some notes uh, to, till the moment when the state receives these notes, what happens and who does it? That's an interesting question. Um, it's um, a divided function, in fact. Uh, the instructions to create the currency electronically come from the European Central Bank. But the actual uh, creation or printing of the euros is done at the national central bank level. And as for the role of the capital markets, I think I addressed that question this afternoon. And I basically said that when you surrender uh, uh, sovereignty of your currency, surrender your fiscal freedom, then you effectively become a user of a currency or the passenger in the car. And the capital markets or the bond markets effectively become the driver. They control the steering wheel. But that's a voluntary choice uh, that was made when you surrendered your currency. It doesn't have to be like that.
Good evening. I would like to ask the following. What's the concrete example of uh, implementation of the MMT in today's world? And also thinking of the past, what's, uh, what can allow us to say this theory works? Is there anything concrete, some examples we can make, quote, and why shouldn't greed and corruption uh, destroy a system, a virtuous system in theory, like what, the one that the MMT propounds? But then there is always greed, there is always evil. So how can we be sure about that? That's very good. Um, so in many ways, I am often quoted as saying how I regret the T in the MMT. Because a theory is something that might be right, and it might not be right. It's just a theory, after all. But what MMT does, more than any other approach that I am aware of in economics, is to try to explain how things work in the real world, down to the last operational detail. How does it all work? And so this is not a theoretical description. It might work like this. We have done the hard work to explain how government finance operates in countries with their own currency and how government finance works in countries that don't have a sovereign currency. We've looked at the euro very closely. We've looked at fixed exchange rate systems very closely, the gold standard. We've explained how everything works. Then there's the prescriptive side of MMT. That's the policy side. The most important policy that supporters of MMT have advocated over the years is the job guarantee, the employer of last resort. Is there any evidence that such a policy could work? And the answer is yes. And the best example I can give you is the case of Argentina, where Randy Ray and Bill Mitchell and Pavlina Cherneva and some of the other core members of MMT worked with the government, with the Minister of Labor in Argentina to implement on a somewhat limited scale a job guarantee. It was available not to anyone who wants a job, but to the head of household. One job per household. But Argentina did it, and it worked tremendously. And we have written papers and captured video and interviews with the people who took jobs in the job guarantee program. A million people were hired. People were lifted out of poverty. It was tremendously successful there in Argentina. So it's the best example I can give you. A real world experiment has been going on. We talk about natural experiments. These were not designed by professors. You see the EU without a sovereign currency, embracing austerity, and the Eurozone promptly goes into recession. You see the United States following a mild to moderate expansion, and you see a mild to moderate recovery from the recession as well. So, there are a number of real-world tests going on, none of them designed by professors, and all of them have been supportive of MMT in the real world. Hi. We talked about the Pecora, who in 1929 was able to condemn and the gangsters, in the, the bankers in the city. And then there was a law that was uh, uh, 
uh, also, and there, there is a similar no law uh, submitted in the, uh, or a bill actually submitted in Italian Parliament. Having said this, would you uh, be in favour of a proposal like this one after 1929? Yes, uh, both parts. You should do a real investigation and you should adopt your own version of Glass-Steagall. Good evening. My question is an objection that is normally raised by people when I talk about going out of the euro and going back to our national currency. Is it enough to go back to the lira without modifying European treaties, for example, or without going out of the European Union? And more specifically, going back to the lira with the uh, need to have uh, balanced budgets uh, which will be introduced in the uh, Constitution. Is this possible? Will it be possible for us to go back to Lira with this new amendment to the Constitution which requires balance in the budget? This uh, I could answer. Uh, first, uh, there is no possibility of amending the European treaties in uh, Keynesian, post-Keynesian, or MMT, or circuitist way. Because the European order has its logic. This logic is the total dismantling of the state. And thereby, those who control Europe will never accept any change. As for the new treaty, it is something of a scandal, the total abdication of sovereignty. When you look at history, budgets were never balanced. Never. During even the gold standard era, France, England always run enormous deficits relative to what is now the European standard. And nobody objected. So, uh, there is no possibility of agreement. It is exactly, if you asked the Pope to decree that the Christ is not the Son of God the Father, That said, if they change the Constitution to require a balanced budget, you can change the Constitution to unrequire a balanced budget. The Euro and the EU have never been coterminous. Look at the Brits. So you can be part of the EU without being part of the Euro.
to imagine objections and criticisms, and I saw many of them on the, in the internet, and I uh, selected one, but I will give Paolo a list. But, I mean, the first one is that, isn't there a risk that maybe creating one's own currency uh, could be abused by the Italian political um, class, thereby determining uh, negative consequences? <laughs> responsible uh, behavior of Italian political class? Well, I'll answer that very quickly. I mean, if that, is, that is a risk, uh, clearly, that the money is not spent the, the right way. But ask yourself this. Did you live better in the 1970s, the 1980s, uh, in spite of all the political corruption that we know existed in Italy? Or do you live better now? under the European Monetary Union. To me, that's a red herring. I would, I would ask a very short comment, Paolo Standard. <clears throat> very few people imagine that Brussels is the den of corruption of the rule of lobbies on a scale which would make uh, jealous the most corrupt Wall Street and Wall Street politician Americans. All the European elite is entirely corrupted. Let us assume that I am wishing for a life of luxury. I sent a mail to the chair of the European Central Bank and say I am in love with your policy. I could receive grants for an unlimited amount of money and all Orthodox economists in Europe survive now like prostitutes of the European institutions. There's no reason to insult prostitutes by comparing them to economists. <laughs> There is something I would like to correct, Bill, if I may, because it's not true that Italy, with a balanced budget imposed by the European Treaty in, and then um, amended the Constitution, can then change its Constitution, because the Treaty of Lisbon, which is binding for Italian legislation, um, actually, according to an opinion of the European Court of Justice, I think it's 1 slash 9 1, defines the Treaty of Lisbon as the constitutional charter of the European Union, which therefore is uh, overarching, which is more uh, important, legally binding, than national constitutions. And the Court of Justice has a power of vetoing and sanctioning the country that infringes these treaties, in particular the Lisbon Treaty, and also based on the fiscal compact uh, agreed a few days ago, uh, there are also sanctions, uh, monetary sanctions, which could be 2 billion euros. So changing the constitution is not legally an option for us in Italy. These are the treaties, so be careful about treaties. Um, no, I, I have a different view. Uh, be rough and ruddy about a treaty like that. We have uh, a president of the United States who famously said, the Supreme Court has made its decision, now let it try to enforce it. And if you get a new government that is unwilling to go forward with that basis, they cannot afford to enforce the treaty without destroying the EU entirely. 
you actually have the leverage. Yeah. A very short uh, ad. Chancellor Bismarck once said treaties are made to be ignored, violated. How could the European Union impose sanctions? Yes. As I, as I said in an interview, they are now discussing in Brussels the creation of some kind of a European force recruited as mercenaries to intervene. But I am not sure that it could be accepted because it is such a violation of any kind of human rights that it is a joke. As for the European Court of Justice, it is appointed by governments. So, it is worse than the European, than the U.S. Supreme Court. They lack any independence. Remember, the hypothetical was Italy withdraws from the euro and reintroduces its own currency. If you do that, the EU loses its leverage over Italy. That's the key. That's what Marshall was explaining to you. The leverage comes only because you no longer own your own currency. But the problem that we is that uh, most of our debt is in, is in the hands of uh, uh, international, big international investors. Japan, for instance, has no kind of problems with crisis of sovereign debt because, uh, of course, they, they hold 90% of the sovereign debt. Let me come to some concrete proposals, and I'd like to hear your opinions as experts. We could proceed as follows. For instance, uh, we could use uh, gold uh, reserves uh, in Italy, the third world reserve, about 200 billion euros at, uh, at the moment, uh, and use uh, um, bonds with uh, the Italian heart heritage as a collateral, and this uh, bonds uh, using gold and Italian uh, artistic heritage as collaterals could be offered to Italian citizens. So in April, the, we shouldn't only use 400 billion, billion, but only 100, then that would be absorbed. And international investors and usurers wouldn't have that leverage anymore. So this means rejecting the fiscal impact that was mentioned by Paolo, uh, signed by, uh, by the, in, on, in January. So reducing the debt from 120 to 60 in 20 years. So this would mean that the state would uh, remove from the economy about 3% per year. So it, it would be a big maneuver. And Italy would be condemned to an epoch-making recession. It would uh, happen automatically. So we need to reject that at all costs. I don't know whether with a coup d'etat or something else. It's just a joke. I'm kidding. So I'll be taken away by the police. It's just a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
So two proposals, two concrete proposals. I don't know whether you understood me. Uh, unfortunately, a French friend expresses an opinion that uh, uh, even a um, nobody else would express uh, Mais uh, Freemasonry is an instrument uh, the church uh, Atali, Bernacchi, Krugman and so on and so forth uh, 2% of the world population that could uh, saturate by itself only 1% that uh, stands on top of the food chain thank you uh, well, Stephanie, Stephanie's going Stephanie. well I'll start yeah. the, the issue with Japan is not about the debt being held internally versus externally. That is not why Japan is able to sustain a very high debt level. The, the reason that Japan can have debt to GDP ratios of 200% and higher is because all of the debt is denominated in yen. It doesn't matter whether the bonds are held in by American banks, Chinese banks, Japanese banks, European banks. What matters is that the government of Japan has issued bonds and promised only to pay in yen. And it can do that no matter the magnitude. Remember what I said earlier today. Italy's debt 15 years ago was exactly the same as it is today. 120% of your GDP. And you did not have a debt crisis. Yes. Your debt was your own. It didn't matter who held it. It mattered that it was in lira. And you had the lira. It's your currency. You controlled it. And because you controlled it, financial markets couldn't bully you. When you want to borrow today, you take off your hat and you go out begging for euros. You sell bonds on the capital market and you compete with everybody else who's trying to raise euros. And financial markets look at all the potential borrowers and they judge you. Who's most likely to pay me back? Germany, France, they get low interest rates. Who's likely to have trouble paying me back. Who might not be able to come up with the euros? Greece, Ireland, Spain, Portugal. High interest rates. They own you. They set the terms and you're stuck. And it's not about who owns the bonds, it's about how the debt is denominated. You see, uh, I must add, uh, in defense of uh, international markets, they are themselves used by governments. A friend of mine is working. He's one of the most important rating agencies. He told me that they received a specific order from the French government to downgrade the French debt so as to justify a new plan of deflation. What only matters in the European Union is not the debt, it is deflation and total destruction of the state. It is pure propaganda, Nazi-like, to speak of the debt. They are completely indifferent to this question. What they want is total deflation of the European economy.
respect to the euro, what uh, your opinion about uh, the treaty signed on uh, the 2nd of February? Was the new relationship established with the International Monetary Fund? Well, uh, first, what is extremely interesting is that the new treaty received very, very little propaganda. The French media, for instance, have been forbidden by the government to speak of the new treaty because it is an absolute violation of the Constitution. And the new treaty really is unbelievable from any perspective. It instores the total abdication of sovereignty for the state. It imposes not only balanced budget, but surplus budget, which never existed in the world before. And there is worse. The new treaty explicitly has a paragraph. All budgets should be endorsed by the European Commission. So it is truly what I, I could be deemed the creation of the Fourth Reich in Europe, thereby the true nature of the Euro system now cannot be ignored. Good evening, everyone. I am not happy. Uh, I, it, one day is not enough for me to understand all that. Uh, can you suggest uh, any books that uh, could be maybe shown on a slide tomorrow? We'll try and read them in English if they've not been translated. I have a slogan that uh, goes to the very heart of the issue. Sovereign money and the state must, must come up with the money. Well, I don't know if it's been uh, translated in Italian yet, but um, our friend and colleague, Randy Ray, wrote an outstanding book about 13 years ago called Understanding Modern Money. And I think that is one of the best introductions you'll find about MMT and modern money. And Randy is a very good writer he doesn't use a lot of math and graphs. He doesn't write like an economist, with all due respect to my colleagues. So it's a very readable and easy to understand book for the layman. I would, I would just add that Randy and Marshall and Michael and Bill and I all contribute to a blog that is available more easily and cheaply. <laughs> Uh, and if you are interested, you can go to the blog. It's called neweconomicperspectives.org. And Randy has been posting um, very short, readable pieces. There's a tab on the blog called MMP. It is a modern money primer. It's for beginners. And so you can also look at that.
Good evening, everyone. At this point, uh, I'll ask a question for tomorrow because I do hope the answer is not too short. Uh, and um, since I think it's really important to know more about the history of this place, the number, the names of the politicians mentioned by Paulo Barnard before, I'd like to get more details. Good morning. <laughs> Domani. Well, we can talk about this tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Where's the light? Where's the light? Not sad. Yep. Okay. It's me. Good evening. Good evening. I have a doubt about the first uh, two... Uh, presentations uh, by Mr. Auerbach and Mr. Pargus. Uh, uh, let me summarize. Uh, Mr. Pargus said there is an ideological line of thinking aiming at destroying the state. That's where the euro came from. Uh, the solution is destroying the euro. And uh, Mr. Auerbach, if I didn't misunderstand him, he said, uh, yes, we have Europe. Uh, the way it is right now, it doesn't work. But uh, by introducing adequate changes, uh, we can uh, make it into a good Europe. But of course, these are two extremely different approaches. If I have a political counterpart or want to set up a movement, then I need to know what I have to ask. One thing, of course, is asking why don't we find a remedy for this kind of, of Europe? But then we're not asking to destroy it. Do you have a common line of thinking or do you have divergences and disagreements? Um, in particular, I'd like to know where, whether Mr. Auerbach would like a Mr. Pargwood's solution. I'm talking about going back and uh, destroying Europe. And would Mr. Par uh, Pargwitz accept a Mr. Auerbach's solution? And uh, missed, uh, a, a question for Stephanie Kelton. Uh, uh, and. Uh, I've read something about it, uh, about Keynes, and he said that in periods of deflation economic difficulty, one should spend on deficit, but the deficit has to be repaid in times of economic prosperity. If this is true, how can this be reconciled with the modern money theory? Okay, let, let me, uh, it's a long question. Let me, let, let me try to answer this uh, very quickly. The, the, there, there are really two different questions. One of the questions I was asked uh, after this afternoon's presentation is, given the current institutional arrangements, what is the most effective short-term remedy to alleviate the current disaster going on in Europe? And I gave a uh, technical answer which related to actions which could be undertaken by the European Central Bank. I suggested a per capita revenue sharing agreement, a distribution uh, to each of the countries. Operationally, that would work. There is, however, a political dimension to this. And the question then becomes one of judgment. Will it be possible for the European authorities to embrace the operationally logical solution which I proposed? And if they are institutionally incapable of doing it, then obviously that will destroy the European Monetary Union. And by the way, I do not think that we should be conflating the European Monetary Union with Europe or the European Union. Europe has always existed and it is, can exist even if people have 17 different currencies. So this is another example of the propaganda that somehow the one follows from the other. Uh, very short comment. Myself, I wrote uh, some kind of draft uh, for 
some kind of uh, post keynesian and circuitist bonnet uh, reform of the euro system. The problem is that it is entirely rejected by the core governments of Europe. We should never look at European institutions as scapegoats. The criminals are the European governments, the European politicians who want forever what I deemed the new order, and they will never by themselves make any kind of concession. As for uh, the European Central Bank do not exist, doesn't exist. It is a very weak oligarchy of 17 central banks entirely controlled by the French and the German ones, both of them controlled by the French and the German governments. And now I would say that the very idea of Europe is a pure ideology. Europe never existed as a kind of United States. So, de facto, no solution maintaining the system can be accepted. And there is a reason. Too many people are obsessed by banks. I must say I am more and more bored by the debate, by the debate on banks balance sheet. We are forgetting that the real European economy is dying, if not dead. And this is the core question. So, the, the so-called financial market now are a parasite which possessed the brains or are used by the true brains of Europe. So how many suicides in Italy and France would be required to appease that economy of human sacrifice, which is now the European economy. I'll answer your question about Keynes and Lerner. And of course you can find almost anything in Keynes because his work spans so many years and there were so many different monetary systems in place when he was writing. On and off the gold standard, Britain went. And what you're talking about when there was a highly deflationary period was during the Great Depression and Keynes advocated big increases in the deficit, right? You're saying that doesn't sound like MMT because Keynes said run a big deficit during the Depression and then balance the budget. 
But Keynes also learned about functional finance from Abba Lerner, and they wrote letters back and forth, and we have the letters. And when Keynes learns about functional finance from Lerner, he's fascinated. And he writes a letter to Lerner, and he tells him, when I return, I'm going to get a meeting with the people in the Treasury, where Keynes worked for a time, and we're going to talk about the merits of functional finance. So these are in Keynes's later years, and of course he dies soon after, but it's, I think the record is pretty clear that Keynes was very open to the possibility of more sustained use of government deficit spending. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, all of us uh, for being so brave as to fund uh, such an amazing event, to pay for it and be here now. Because in a world, we live in a world made of fear and showing courage is a revolutionary action. As uh, stated by Paolo Barnard in his writings, uh, this system of lobbies uh, as transatlantic business dialogue, the group of the 30 and so on and so forth, uh, pra practically nullifies whatever forms of political activity. So my questions are the following. Don't you think it could be possible since uh, there are lots of people interested in these issues and we can see that just look around, uh, don't you think it would be possible to uh, set up and create a people's lobby, a sort of counter lobby, counter current lobby from within, the same as you've done with us? How do you say yes? See. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> it's a and you should organize a march on Brussels. Hello, everyone. Very quick question. In 1971, Nixon said to the world, we're all Keynesians. And I'm addressing the American speakers in particular. What would happen? Would it be a tragedy if Ron Paul won the elections and you, you would all t be turned into Austrians? And why? I, I think you know why. You, you understand. I do know everybody loves it. Yeah. Well, Ron Paul, for those who don't know, is a uh, candidate for U.S. president running as a Republican, a libertarian, a follower of Hayek, conservative, Austrian, infatuated with gold, convinced that gold is the only sound monetary system that a country can operate. It disciplines the government. It prevents governments from spending money to engage in two trillion dollar wars. He finds it appealing as a way to tie the hands of government. The problem, of course, is that if you have someone in office who would enact good policies, you don't need to tie their hands. And a monetary system like the one that he envisions, think about the hierarchy. It puts gold at the top. So the state doesn't control the currency at the top of the pyramid. It loses its power. It can't intervene when there's a financial crisis, an economic downturn, high unemployment, high poverty, poverty rates, homelessness, sickness, people without health care. The government is incapable of acting. Ron Paul has faith in markets and their ability to find solutions to these things. Keynesians don't. Well, we have a problem. 
We have a contract uh, with the with this place, with this venue. We have to wrap it up at a certain time. <laughs> Uh, so we're running quite late. Uh, we can take two more questions and then we have to close. Tomorrow afternoon, the morning, we'll have MMT, a lot of MMT. Uh, that's really important. Uh, we'll have to focus on the political application of MMT, the default of Italy and so on and so forth. And then we'll take questions in the afternoon. At this point, is the only thing we can do. Somebody's saying something from the audience, but we can't hear. I'm sorry, but we can't hear from here. Well, okay, then. Uh, well, so, if you want to take note of this, uh, just stand there, stand, uh, just stand in line, the same as you're now, so we can take no. I take down your no names, and we can get started again from the last, uh, from the first one who's been left out today. So we can take a couple of questions, and then we go back to this tomorrow. Thank you, good evening, and thank you so much for coming here. I would like to ask a question to Stephanie Kelton. Can you please tell us something more about the trend of monetary aggregates in Argentina? How is it seen by the MMT when applied in that country? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't study and I don't even pay attention to monetary aggregates in the US because I don't particularly think that they give uh, much useful information um, I'm sorry I don't I don't know what's been happening to the growth rates uh, in the money supply I tend to look at the rate of unemployment to gauge the state and health of the economy not the growth of the money supply My uh, name is Davide Oliva. Our slogan is uh, saving people, reforming <laughs> finance. Uh, so uh, the take home message uh, is that there's a conflict between production and speculation. So we need to stress this uh, for all to understand. But my question about your theory as Americans from the United States, uh, the role of Alexander Hamilton and the notion of National Bank and Productive Credit uh, and the role played by the United States vis-a-vis -vis the uh, British Empire and John Maynard Keynes that can be brought back to that kind of economic thought. Uh, in your opinion, your concept of a central bank, to what extent is it, is it different from the Milton's idea in terms of productive credit? It doesn't induce inflation. So is it to be used to create employment and set up a creative process? Um, I, I presume by Milton you mean Milton Friedman. I wasn't sure, but... Um, on the question of um, Alexander Hamilton, uh, he, one of the things he said was that a, a national debt was a national blessing. So he actually understood that it was very important, if you were going to have a successful nation, to have a strong fiscal union, a fiscal transfer union, that you couldn't just have a currency union. And in fact, if you look at the history of the United States, they started off with something very similar to what you have now in Europe. The Articles of Confederation structurally was very similar to the European Monetary Union. You had a number of strong individual states and a supranational fiscal authority which had very limited spending and taxing power. And it didn't work. It failed, which is why you had the creation of a new constitution in the United States in 1789. And Hamilton was one of the key architects of that new constitution. And they, and they took on all the U.S. debt. They took on the debt of the states. And apropos our earlier point, 
we created the U.S. Constitution by basically just having a rogue panel decide we would change the Constitution. <laughs> so they, they junked the Articles of Confederation entirely and created an entirely new Constitution. Well, see you tomorrow, MMT tomorrow morning, getting out of the Euro for Italy and then questions in the afternoon. Thank you.